me introduce myself as they figure out these problems because I realize we're already 15 minutes into the hour. Um, I'm Sarah Robbins. I'm a PhD candidate at Ball State University, which is in Muncie, Indiana, sort of the middle of a cornfield, but we do some pretty techy stuff there. I'm in rhetoric and composition, um, which means I study English but not the literature part, right? <laughs> so I study how and why people communicate. Um, I teach freshman composition, so second semester of freshman comp, that core required writing class that all undergrad students dread. But I teach it in Second Life. I've been doing it now for two semesters. And the project is funded by the Center for Media Design. If you've heard of the Middletown Media Studies that were conducted in, in Muncie, Indiana, they, they do those studies and they fund my research. So um, last summer, they bought us two islands in Second Life, one for the, the Center for Media Design and one for my class. And I've been teaching on an island called Middletown ever since. Um, last spring, I had to recruit students for this course because they needed to use their own computers to log into Second Life. And for an 18-seat class, I had 300 students apply for the course. For this spring, I had over 200 students went in the course for an 18-seat course. And I thought, wow, I'm on to something. You know, I've got students who want to take freshman comp. I'm doing something right here. Yeah, they're fighting to get into freshman comp. I had to uh, hold a couple of meetings to sort of weed out students, you know, because they hate meetings. And then I made them write a 500-word essay to get into the class. And they, a lot of people still did that, like 60 people. And so the first semester, I just took the first 18 that sent me an essay and said, okay, you're in, you know. Um, and I think I'm going to be teaching two more sessions of it in the fall and in the spring next year. So if you're interested in how a, a class might work in Second Life and you want to observe one, mine meets on Thursday nights. 6.30 Eastern Standard Time on Middletown. You're more than welcome to log in and come by and see the, uh, the chaos that is freshman composition when it happens in Second Life. My dissertation research is on um, mechanics of communication in virtual environments. And so that's why Second Life initially interested me is I wanted to study the communication paths that happen there and other spaces like World of Warcraft and even things like Gmail and uh, instant messaging. So that's sort of the, the work that these talks come out of. Are we, can I just go ahead and start? Keep going. Yeah, okay. So today I'm going to... You're not at the, let's see if we can get her, get her to the... Um, what island is it? It's Cybrary. Cybrary. There we go. <laughs> so right now, folks in Second Life can hear me talk, and they can see my slides, but I'm not standing there yet. So Mark is going to drive my avatar if they can get me in there so I can wave my hands around and stuff. So today I'm going to talk about creating authentic and engaging learning community environments in Second Life. And I don't know, are any of you on the Second Life educators mailing list? A few. There are over 2,000 people on that mailing list right now. It's a very active community. If you're an educator or you're interested in education, if you're a grad student and you're interested in how cl uh, classes are held in Second Life, I really encourage you to be part of that mailing list. It's a really great community, very, very active. Um, and everybody from you know noobs uh, coming into Second Life for the first time, having never taught in Second Life, all the way to folks like me who have been teaching there for a year or so are on that list. Lots and lots of helpful folks on that list. Um, but there's, a, there's always an avid discussion there of how to build a learning space in Second Life. What should it look like? How do we make it welcoming to students? What do students need in Second Life based on what subject you're teaching, how big the class is? And so there's always this constant debate. Do we recreate real life spaces? Do we create these spaces that aren't even possible in real life? You know, have students sit upside down or, you know, have them have class on top of a volcano. You have so many options that it's almost daunting to make those decisions. And because UNC is sort of at that point, you have a couple of islands and it's sort of under development. As I was flying around last night, I was sort of checking out what was there already. I'm going to talk about how these virtual environments offer challenges to creating these, these um, authentic and engaging learning spaces. How are we doing? Yeah. That's me. That's sort of me. Okay. 
So before I get into the construction of these spaces, I want to talk about the identity of spaces. One of the great things about Second Life is we have this very flexible identity. With a click, you can go from being male to female. I have a dog avatar I can put on really quick, and I can even scratch my ear and run around, a dinosaur. And so these identities are very fluid and flexible, and identities of space are the same way in Second Life. And so we have all of these sort of plastic constructions that we have to play with. People have the same sort of identities, and if you think uh, about what your multiple identities are, you'll sort of start to generate the kind of list that I'm talking about. Relationship identities. One of the first things you would probably tell me if you told me what your identities were is, I'm a mother, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a wife or a husband, I'm a cousin, right? So you have an identity based on your relationships to other people. That's one of the ways we identify ourselves. Professions. In America, we have this thing. You meet somebody, you say, oh, I'm Sarah, what do you do? We identify ourselves by our professions. It's an important part of who we are and how we live our lives. Activities. You might mention when you meet someone what you do for fun. I play football, I breed cats, you know, I knit. Um, and so you identify yourself by those activities as well. Your personality. Personality is one of those identities that other people tend to use to describe people that they know. Well, what's she like? Well, she's funny. She has a great personality. <laughs> and so um, personality traits are part, big parts of our identity. And spaces have these identities as well. And I'll talk more about that as we kind of get into this. And style. Everybody has a sense of style. And so our style can also, even if it's just the style of our dress, can identify us as part of a group or as not wanting to be part of a group. Most people will go, oh, Sarah, she always wears black and pink. Yeah, I do. And you'll see my avatar is black and pink, too. So it's, it's a way to identify myself. But if I wore a uniform or if I had on a UNC t-shirt, you would know that I identify myself as part of another group that's labeled by that, by that uh, uniform. So online spaces have identities as well. And all of the online spaces that you visit, whether they be your email inbox, the school website, they all have identities that are developed very carefully, hopefully very carefully, by those who make them. So for example, if we just use these five categories that we used to describe our personal identities, but we use them to describe an online space, this is my personal website. Which of these five categories do you think apply to the website? All of them? I would say it doesn't have a whole lot to do with activity. It doesn't, there's not like a hobbies page on my website, but it definitely has something to do with my profession, right? Right on the front page, PhD candidate. My personality and style definitely come through. I mean, you can see from the logo, like, I'm not afraid to say, I have pink hair. <laughs> you know, it's not a secret. MySpace. Which of the categories do you think apply here? Now, I have a, the most boring MySpace page in the universe. If you've seen MySpace, it's a study in how not to design a website. You know, if I want an annoying website to show my students what not to do in website design, I always go to MySpace, but I have a pretty boring site. We definitely have relationships. You can see who my friends are, and everybody else can see who my friends are. And a little bit about activities. They give you these forms that you can fill in to say what books you like, what your interests are. It's very dictated by the system. The mechanics of the system tell you what forms of expression you'll have. Facebook, Many, much less choice. Right? Facebook is very clean. It used to be very profession related because only students were on Facebook. Now it's opened up, so that's less true. But activities, you can see I have a mini feed. It tells you what I've been doing lately or what my friends are doing lately. And we definitely have relationships because, again, we have who, who are your friends? Who do you know? Who knows you? LinkedIn. Anybody use LinkedIn? <laughs> Fewer people use LinkedIn. It's a professional networking site. There's no profile picture. There's no setting of colors on your profile. It's very dictated, very clean space. 
and it focuses only on your relationships and your profession. And you can see here that it says how many people these people know, how many connections they have as sort of a status. If you have more connections, maybe you're more special. I don't know. Delicious. You use delicious? Yeah, very useful. Um, but even less personalized. You can't see my profession because you can see I have a, link, a list of tags that are dissertation. So, you know, if I worked at Walmart, I probably wouldn't be writing a dissertation. That wouldn't be my profession, right? So it's, it, it kind of dictates my profession. And activity, just by looking at the things that I bookmark, you can sort of tell a little bit about me by looking through my bookmarks. But no style, no personality, right? You can't adjust the visuals of it at all. Skype or IM, you can see the relationships because, again, I have a friends list, so you can see who I know, or at least I can see who I know. Other folks can't see your list. Photo or media sharing, and it's, we're, getting, we're getting into more dynamic spaces, more spaces that have more of these attributes. Because you can um, see more about me, my relationships, you can see who my friends are. Profession, I have photos here from a conference I was at, so you can tell a little bit about my profession. Activities I engage in, I was a part of a photo gamer group here, so I took this picture of pink spaghetti um, <laughs> for, that, uh, for that competition. Personality and style are expressed through the photos that I take. These are my daughters, by the way. I have five-year-old triplets. They were playing with uh, eyeballs from a mask at Denny's, sticking them to their heads and to my glasses. Um, so you can tell a little bit more about personality and style through these expressions of, of photography on this site. Click. Avatars. Now we're getting into more tailored senses of expression. This is a, a me from the Wii gaming system. And this is my me. And as you can tell, you only have certain categories of personalization here. There's four pages of eyes, but you know, there's maybe uh, 12 choices per page times four. You see that you know, in Second Life, I can make my eyes this big or this big with a click. But here, I, I have a choice of just a few. This is my avatar from Second Life. Much different, right? Because here we have more choices. It all comes down to choice, about shaping the choices of identity, of avatars, of spaces, and, as I'll say later, of learning environments. The more choice, the more expression. In Second Life, I can, well, I have like, well, maybe 30 pink hairdos in my inventory, and I can pop those on any time I want. I could make my own. With the me, I, I have probably, I don't know, three screens of hairdos to choose from, and that's it. And pink is not an option. I'm stuck. It's like it sussed out my natural hair color and said, that's all you can have, you know. Um, but in Second Life, I have so many options. That my clothes, I can change them all the time. I can change my makeup. I can say, I like freckles or I don't like freckles. And within a second, I can change it. And so I have this uh, ability to have way more expressive qualities in an avatar. And the space is the same way. What you're looking at in the background there are the dorms on my island. Um, my students have dorms that they can move into because if you're in Second Life, you know it's really a real estate system. That's where Lyndon makes their money is on real estate. And I want my students to have free accounts. So I give them a place to live because I think having a sense of place is important. But I built those dorms from scratch. I could have made them igloos. I could have made them up in the air, hot air balloons they could live in, right? But I chose a certain familiar set that looked a little bit more like something that was from our campus, but not quite. So activity is expressed through avatars. I could put on a baseball uniform and express some activity that I'm in. Personality and style, no doubt. Now, I do have a tag above my head that says educator with my name. So I can't express my profession, but I could be lying. Right? Okay? So authenticity is, is sort of a, an important point. Oh, that's back. There we go. James Paul G. has this great book about what video games can teach us about literacy and learning. 
And he has this wonderful theory of identity that I think ties very well into creating education spaces in virtual environments. He's talking about the identity of game players, but you'll see we can apply it directly to spaces as well. There's three categories. The first is the virtual. One's identity as a virtual character. So when you play Mario, Mario is your virtual identity, right? And you can see this is the mechanics of Second Life with the appearance editor there where you can change yourself. The real, the identity of the user behind the character, the person at the keyboard. And we can argue, argue about the subjectivity of who we really are all day long, but he's, he's saying the physical you is your real identity. Oh, wrong button again. And the projective is the way we project ourselves, our real selves, into the virtual self. So me as Mario, right? So when I play Mario Brothers, I am the same Mario that you are running across from left to right as we have to. Maybe you pick up every coin on the screen and that's the projective version of Mario that you play. You know, very controlled and very thorough. But I just kind of run through and jump down the tube and go. Same character, but different projective identities. We operate that same character a different way. And in Second Life, we have this very fluid projective identity that we can formulate. We can be our real selves, very close to our real selves if we try to, or we can be somebody totally different and role play and play with all these varied identities if we want. Now, I'm going to make a leap here and I'm going to start applying these identities to spaces. So what are the identities expressed in a learning space? Here comes the argument. Typical higher education classroom. Is there a relationship implied in this classroom? What is that relationship? Temporary neighbors, Temporary neighbors right? Yeah, the guy who sits next to you may not sit next to you tomorrow. Audience, Audience which implies that there is somebody in control who's probably a peer with the infamous Elmo that nobody knows how to use. At least they don't at Ball State. So we have a relationship implied by the space. Somebody up front is in charge, and if you sit out here, you're not in charge, right? Profession, can you tell what subject this classroom is for? No, and the only person practicing a profession in this space is the person who stands up here. The students are students, but they're passive. An activity, what activity do you read in this space? Listening. Receiving of knowledge, right? I will stand up here and I will give you what you need to know. There's no personality and there's no style. It's very institutional. So we are our real selves in this space and that's it. Unless you daydream really authentically. You, you, that's the, um, you, can't, you can't be a projected identity. You cannot pretend in this space to take on the subject that you are learning about. Um, you, you can only be a student. You can only be a receiver. This is the room I thought we were going to be in, according to the website. <laughs> I thought, ooh, I'll pull, a, I'll pull a room from this space. A little bit better. Relationships are a little more active only because people are sharing a table. There's two seats to a table, so maybe you're closer. Again, no profession implied, no activity implied, other than you sit in these seats and someone sits up front. Certainly no personality and no style. Again, only the real. We have no chance to pretend to be someone else in this space. We have no chance to try out new identities in this space. We are limited to being the passive receivers of knowledge. This is the same, a similar type of stadium seating lecture hall, but with students in it, it's a little different. The professor is up here actually writing something for one of the students, not quite as distant. So there's a little more relationship implied. We can see whether the, stu the students sit close to each other or not. I, th I really think this kid's asleep, I'm not sure, which is pretty typical in a room like this. Um, there's a little more activity involved. We know that they act they're writing something. They do need notebooks, so there, there may be some activity. 
But again, personality and style is based on an individual level. It's not inherent in the room. It's not inherent in the space. Can these students try out new identities in this space? Can they project themselves into some kind of virtual potential of their future in this profession, in this subject area? Probably not. They're probably pretty limited to being, to being students because they're sitting in the student seats. This class is different. Um, it's definitely a different setup. So you see we have this, we have one ring around the outside a smaller ring in the inside. Does that set up imply a relationship to you? Yeah, the people in the middle are either special or they're the guinea pigs. I'm not sure which, you know? But even then, you only get to look at their backs. It's not like they're engaging the rest of the students who are going to be sitting in that outside space. And there's still this very privileged space in the front. The students are not as close to this whiteboard, which is the kind of a communal information dissemination tool, right? They are trapped behind those desks. A little more fluid, but still, there's not uh, a whole lot of activity implied here other than sitting there, maybe in sitting in a different seating arrangement, but they're still sitting. No personality, no style, no implied profession here. And again, unless this is like, uh, maybe they're using this for government and it's for, um, you know, they're pretending to be Congress or something and they're going to throw things at whoever's standing up there or yell at them and filibuster, I'm not sure. But really no projected identity here. No opportunity to um, investigate other identities. Very static. But this is different. We've all taken biology classes. We've all had to be in a lab, chemistry lab. Is there a relationship implied in this space? Some? The folks sitting here are probably going to be doing something different than the people standing there. There definitely is a profession implied, right? Some kind of scientific profession. This is not an art classroom. This is not home ec. If you cook somewhere like this, I wouldn't need it. You know, it's very, it's, you know. Um, there is definitely an activity implied, right? If you went into this room, you would immediately know, ooh, I can pour this beaker into that beaker. I mean, that's, that's an implied activity of the space. It may not have a whole lot of personality and style as we would consider sort of individualistic personality and style, but it carries the personality of the profession in which the students are going to be practicing. So we have real projected identity here. If the real is the student and the virtual is a scientist, in this space, the students get to play in that projected identity because they get to pretend to be scientists. They get to practice being scientists, hands-on, actually experiencing what that profession does. They couldn't do that in those seats all aimed at the front. They couldn't pretend to be anything other than what they were. This is a classroom too. Yeah? Is there a relationship implied here? These people know each other, right? <laughs> Their heads are all together. They're definitely engaged. There's nobody bored in this picture. Profession. Definitely engaged in some kind of scientific field work. Not sure what they're gathering, but whatever it is, they're all very interested in it. They're engaged in the same activity. Nobody's kind of wandering off to the side twiddling their thumbs personality of the space is, even though it's a large outdoor space, the activity implies a personality of closeness and of cooperation and collaboration. This, I, I'm going to contend with you that this is the kind of space that we're trying to build in Second Life. This is the kind of classroom that we should be working towards in this collaborative, virtual, very creative environment where ev everything is possible. Not those other classrooms that I've shown you, not the seats all aimed towards the front. Not a classroom like this. 
it's okay for a lecture, it's okay for a presentation, but for a class that meets every week, this is not the most conducive learning environment. And we know that, and yet we get in there and we still build chairs, but nobody really has to sit down. Real, virtual, and projected is all here. These are students, this is the instructor. The instructor has that real job, and the students are able to practice taking on that role and engage in that role. So they get to play with that projected identity. If the real is who they are as students, and the virtual is sort of the, the role they would like to play, they get to play in that projected space. This is one of the spaces where my class meets. <laughs> this is our coffee shop. Students decorate these walls as semester goes by and they hang up posters from bands that they like or whatever. And this is me and these are my students sitting around and we're having a bit of a discussion at the end of class one night. Relationship implied in this space? Well, sure, we're all facing each other, right? Obviously paying attention to what one another is saying. A profession? Maybe not. Maybe not specific profession. We could be talking about anything current events, English, whatever. Activity. You can't really see anybody typing, but it's definitely a discussion going on. And if you don't see personality and style here, I don't know where you're from. I mean, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of personality going on here. These, um, actually, this, this girl here and this girl here are, were identical twins in real life in my class. And they were infinitely interesting to watch because <laughs> they said, well, we look like each other every day. So in Second Life, we're never going to look like each other. And they didn't. Every day they looked different. It constantly changed. But it's a much different, it's still sitting down and still sort of facing each other, but there's more opportunity for expression. And Second Life in and of itself gives us a, a way to play with a projected identity. Just because we can change our identity, we can redefine how we want others to see us anytime we want. This is also my class. Um, this was right around Halloween. I was Lizzie Borden for Halloween in Second Life. My students all dressed up, so I've got blood splattered all over me, but that's, you know. But they're learning to build. These are all objects. If you've never built in Second Life, you start with these, what we call prims, a primitive object, so a cube or a torus or a ring, and you twist it and shape it, and then you kind of skin it with images to make it look like something that you want. And so they're all practicing building shapes because we're gonna build this big campaign center at the end of the semester. This one was made physical, so we lifted it up and we dropped it, and it actually dropped and hit the ground and kicked up dust. So these are all, these are all students playing around with building. Still kind of an implied relationship because we're in a shared space. Profession, well, they're practicing at being builders, right? There's a definite activity going on here. This is not passive learning here. And personality and style is expressed in the choices that they make and the object that they choose to try to make. I didn't say you have to build a chair. I said, make a cube and make it look as weird as you can. And so that's what they did. They tried out every building tool to make that, that cube look less and less like a cube, if possible. And again, the real and the virtual and the projected, they're um, projecting into this new role that I'm asking them to take on, which is a builder and a designer. Because what they did was they, they wrote um, traditional argument papers, research papers, and then they built a campaign center and did visual representations of their arguments that were interactive. And then we had an open house and some 300 people came by, Second Life residents, and engaged in the students and asked them what they did and what they researched and questioned what the, their findings and things like that. So this is, that's why they're practicing building. This is a board game that I made to teach the students rhetorical situations. So, We've got content, audience, voice, medium, and goal here. And these sticks have floating text on them that you can't see from this angle. That's one of my avatars, by the way, my, my weird pink dinosaur. The way this works is students stand in teams outside of a pole, and they make a choice for that element of the rhetorical situation. For example, medium, brochure, audience, college students, um, purpose, 
um, informative. And so the teams each make a choice, but they can't see what the other teams have chosen because they can't see the hovering text from the distance. And they all come to the middle of the star, and then they can see all of them. And then they hypothesize, they brainstorm about ways to achieve that rhetorical situation. Well, we have to write a brochure for high school students to inform them about the cost of higher education, and we have to use a humorous voice. Hmm. And they play with that rhetorical situation and come up with ideas, and then we move out and we change it again. Very active space. They're moving. They're moving in and out. There was um, little pads out here isolated that were more than 20 meters apart, so they can't overhear other teams. And they go out there and they talk. Well, what should we, you know, what should we make our choice? What should it be? And then they come in and they edit the text to make the hovering text change. And so they're really taking part. And they're trying. What they did is they tried to stump the other groups. They tried to make their choice so crazy that as a class they couldn't come up with something that would that would fit it. There's definitely style in the choices that they made as groups. And in the board itself, it has style. It's pink and black. Everything I make for them seems to be pink and black, but that they know it's mine. Um, and for a profession, they're pretending or they're practicing being rhetoricians. They're practicing evaluating rhetorical situations and addressing them. It's the same practice they're going to have to engage in when they write a paper later, and they have to choose the voice and the audience and the context, and they have to make all those decisions on their own. So that's that projected identity that they get to play with. This is one of the installations that they built. They were talking about the, um, uh, the, higher, the high cost of higher education and the the troubles that that brings up. And that was their choice of topic. It matters a lot to them. Education hits their pocketbooks hard. And so one group did research about why people don't go to college, what they think um, is more worth the money. And they did a survey on campus, and they did a survey online with Survey Gizmo and drove a bunch of people to it. And they found that what people most spend money on when they graduate from high school if they don't go to college is a car. Because, of course, they've got to get a job, so they need a car. And so they did some research about return on investment of a car versus a, high, a college diploma, and they put them on this big scale. This scale actually sort of teetered, and if you clicked on it, you got a note card that had information about their sources for their argument and what they found and the results of their surveys. We couldn't have done this in real life. No way. We, I mean, I don't know. I guess we could have bought some plywood, and you know, but somebody would have died for sure. Uh, no power tools in English class. Um, but they built this in Second Life, and so um, because they were allowed, they were gathering around the space, they were interacting with the space, interacting with folks who visited. There was a relationship between the students and the, the folks who visited. They were able to explain their work um, to uh, just regular residents as, as came by. It wasn't even other students or anything like that. There was an implied activity in the space. It was, see what we've done, talk to us about what we've done. Definitely personality of the groups, personality and style. The groups um, decided how they wanted to visualize their arguments. I didn't dictate that to them. And because they were able to stand there and take questions from residents, some who were very well educated, some who were somewhat important in, in Second Life community, they were able to take on the role of teacher. So instead of submitting papers to me in kind of a black hole fashion, you know, where I read them and nobody else does, they were engaged in this very authentic learning space where they had to defend their work, which I think is very important. Mark and I decided to play with art one time in Second Life, and so this is Hopper's Nighthawks painting, and so we rebuilt it in Second Life, or we tried anyway. <laughs> And in building that and playing with the, the geometry of the painting, we learned a lot about how this painting works, about the lighting, and about the sort of physical impossibility of this restaurant existing. Um, the angles in it are so extreme, but we wouldn't have known it until we tried to make it ourselves. And I guess we could have done it with some poster board and stuff. Um, but it was much more fun to do it in Second Life. And my students sort of took the cue, and a couple of them did some different, some other art projects. Um, we did uh, American Gothic, too. Um, 
But one of my students did the pearl earring, you know, with the looking over her shoulder, and, and so she made that outfit for that and took a screenshot of it to see. And she's like, I think her neck is craned at a weird angle. I want, I wonder if that would, if that's possible. And so, she tried to recreate that. But again. Lots of activity, lots of personality and style embedded in the choices of art that they decided to engage with. And an ability to do something that they couldn't do in real life, that projected play, to um, experiment with recreating great art without having to have a lot of art skill. They could have tried to repaint, you know, to make a facsimile of one of these things, but building it was better. These are my students. <laughs> uh, I said it was chaos. I meant it. So here I am in my tutu and my roller skates um, because they were in groups along this boardwalk and it was just easier to roller skate between them sometimes. Um, this experiment, we were doing um, ethnographic research. We were working towards being able to do ethnographic and participant observation research. So I gave them a box of free avatars, of free outfits, crazy outfits, and the Kool-Aid man was one of them. I split them into groups and I said, your group, you pick one avatar out of this box and all of you wear it, and then I'm going to send you to a very busy place in Second Life. So this group picked the uh, Kool-Aid man avatar, and I sent them to a dance club, <laughs> a very busy dance club. And I said, don't interrupt what they're doing, you know, don't stop what they're doing, but take notes on how you feel in the space. If you feel like an outsider, how people react to you and how they treat you. So they did, and they were supposed to have 40 minutes. They were supposed to go away for 40 minutes and come back and then compare notes with the rest of the class. And they were gone for about, oh, five. <laughs> they got kicked out of the dance club, <laughs> and they got sent back. And uh, it turns out they were too big, right? So in Second Life, you can actually bump people, and they'll move, to, they'll move aside. So they teleport into this dance club with this nice dance floor and everybody's shaking it and they teleport in and immediately it's like bowling for avatars. As soon as they move around, people are falling and being knocked out of the way and of course they were getting annoyed by that, right? And um, one of the guys was on a very slow internet connection so he could see what was going on but he had little control over what was going on. And so he would walk and then he couldn't stop. He would just keep walking and no matter what he did, he would keep moving and so he's like, sorry, 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 sorry. And people are just like falling all over the place, right? So they got sent back. I was like, at first I thought, wow, that was a failure. You know, like that was a bad exercise. Maybe that didn't work. And then one of the girls in the group said, wow, I know what obese people feel like now. Because I felt too big. Like she tried to get behind the bar and she couldn't fit. She said, I've never felt that way before. And one of the guys said, well, it wasn't that scary because you guys were with me. I wasn't the only Kool-Aid man in the dance club. You know, if I was the only one, that would be weird. But we were all together. So in one exercise in this virtual space, I was able to teach them um, how it felt to be included or excluded in a community, which then went on to form their practice at trying to integrate into a community to do participant observation in the community. And I, I can't think of a way I could have done that on campus and none of us got arrested, you know? Like, I could have given them dress-up clothes and said, okay, go down to the coffee shop and get kicked out, but um, it probably wouldn't have worked. But because I let them sort of drive the activity, I let them choose what avatar they wanted to wear, I gave them a choice of places they could go, um, they chose the dance club, they were sort of driving the activity. and. They did have their own personality and style and how they executed the activity. And so they were able to pretend to be researchers or practice being researchers with low risk. So if we talk about like Eric Erickson's theory of the psychosocial moratorium, that opportunity to experiment with little repercussion, Second Life gives, gives us an awesome opportunity to do that. But to make that happen, we have to take the constraints off the students and let them experiment. If we tell them how to go about learning something, then we've robbed them of the experience that they could have if they did it on their own. Now these are screenshots I took of the UNC island. And I don't want to be like, oh, I'm better than you, or my space is better, but I wanted to sort of um, investigate what UNC has built so far. And so we have, you know, a gazebo. I just took these last night and they were on my laptop so they're kind of bad. And um, this building here with the, uh, this is a blueprint if it's hard for you to see in photographs, the real building. 
with the uh, virtual building behind it. Now, to me, and you can, the folks responsible for this can disagree with me, um, this is a very dictated activity place. It's, you will feel familiar in this space and that's it. You will see what real campus looks like, but there's no flexibility of activity in this space. There, um, there's no um, opportunity to investigate other identities. The identity of this space is depicted, is, is determined already, because the identity really exists. It's here. Supposedly. We haven't seen it. Haven't seen that building yet. <laughs> and so the real equals the virtual in this set, in this case, because they're the same. And the projected, which should be that play space in the middle, doesn't exist yet. Yet, right? We're, we're real, just beginning. Cool, awesome. Because that's what we need. It's that space between the two where the learning happens. Self and self talk about how interfaces have sort of inherently politicized views of identity. The interface, no matter how. Um, generic we make it still has certain mechanics that are available to us and certain that aren't and they, they make decisions for us just by making certain things possible and other things not possible. This idea of self-representation, expression, and interaction are critical for these active learning spaces. In Second Life we create the interface because we build the space. What politics, social constraints, and potential identities are we building into our learning spaces? On campus, we have these kinds of learning spaces. And we all know, if you've ever taught in a room like this, you know that pretty soon you're like, OK, come in, move the chairs around in a circle, or put them in groups, or whatever. And so you're already customizing the space to work better for active learning. But in Second Life, we have this bottomless box of Legos in the build menu that lets us make whatever we want. And the students can participate in that activity. And they can build a learning space that is best for them. And if it doesn't work, you just change it. You just throw it away, and you build something new. To learn authentically, we must be allowed to be our real selves. We cannot be roped into being something that we are not if we're going to learn authentically. If you've ever been in a creative writing class, for example, where you had to sort of open your heart and let other people rip your stories apart, yeah. Um, if everybody's real and authentic, it doesn't hurt so much. But if people are pretending to be something you know, more important than they really are, that, that can be sort of painful. So that's just one example of being our real selves lets us learn authentically. To be engaged, we must work toward a virtual or ideal identity. We have to have this goal of who we could be if we understood something in mind. You know, If I master this skill, it's going to get me to point B. And I'm going to be able to do this or that or this new skill or that profession. So we have to be able to um, idealize or envision what this form of learning can allow us to become. And to form community, we have to share our projected potential, potentials. So as a group, we have to have a common vision. Even if we get to that point in different ways, we have to be able to see a common goal and collaborate to get there. Second Life allows us to collaborate and communicate in all these different ways in this very creative, very uh, flexible setting. But if we don't work together as groups with students and let them see their own potential and let them try to um, shape their own path to that potential, we sort of take it away from them. So we have to think of ourselves more as um, travel guides you know, I know the high points of the city, and I've been here before. And I want to make sure that you don't miss, you know, the Acropolis, okay, and the Colosseum. But I want you to go off the path and discover your own places and bring that information back to the class and teach us what you have learned. 
when we teach with technology, we hope to master a, you know, a technology before we introduce it to our students so that we know it inside and out and we can help them learn. But with something like Second Life that is constantly evolving, which is why it's great, we can't. We can't be the experts. And so we have to give up that role and give it to our students and let them collaborate with us and engage in that conversation so that we can all teach each other. And like for example, when I teach in Second Life, I sit in a, a, we sit in a round gazebo. Um, and we very rarely sit there, like at the beginning and end of class, just for a few minutes to sort of group. But there's no front, right? And when you click on it, it randomly assigns you a seat. So there's no way to say, well, I want to sit higher, I want to sit lower, I want to sit over there. It just puts you places. And so I have no, um, no spot of preference, according, you know, against my students. Uh, your avatar doesn't look any older or any more uh, educated than your students do, right? So you enter this uh, environment on even footing. And so we have to remember that um, we have to use that to our advantage. And we have to put the students in charge of that learning, but we have to create spaces that allow them to do that, that don't dictate how knowledge will be received in this space. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Right on time, since we started late. Can I take any questions? Mm -hmm. We do meet face to face, but I'll be honest, the reason why we meet face to face is because uh, this is only the second semester I've taught in Second Life, and um, I wanted to make sure that, that everything was going to go okay before I do a, a completely online class, but I think I'm going to do that in the fall, now that I know how it will work, <laughs> and it won't go completely crazy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't, I haven't used the Second Life yet, but when you teach the class, um, is it all audio, like everybody can speak and talk with each other, but, or is it all typing? That's a good question. We use text um, because, for me, it, because it's a writing class, the more text we can generate, the better. And um, they talk over each other, so we have chat logs of, of even the last 15 minutes of class, we'll generate like 20 single-spaced pages of chat log because everybody's <laughs> on top of each other. But there is going to be integrated voice in Second Life soon, probably sometime this summer. If you want to use voice now, you have to use third-party software. So some people will choose to teach using voice, and I can imagine using that for certain things, like when we're practicing building, it would be easier to just talk to everybody. But I'm probably going to stick to text um, for the majority of my teaching because I want them to generate that text, and I want them to have to engage in each other through writing because that's what I'm teaching. So how do you, so you say the people who are there can hear your, your Yeah, we're streaming the audio in. So they can hear. So you use third party software to, to get the audio. Where did we use? Winamp and Shoutcast. There you go. <laughs> Larry can tell us Winamp and Shoutcast. Uh huh. So, how large a class would you feel comfortable doing in the second month? Yeah, I have 18 students. Um, Having only taught there for a couple of semesters, I'm comfortable with 18 or 20. But, you know, on a typical Thursday night, because so many educators are interested in Second Life but don't have a space of their own yet, we usually get about 10 visitors. And I open it up to educators who want to who wanna visit. But my rule is you have to participate. If you're going to sit in, you've got to play the game, right? If whatever we're going to do, however crazy it is, you've got to do it. And so I've managed, you know, about 30 people at once. And it's, it's not too horrible. Um, the real limitation is, is how many avatars a space can support. An island, which is the smallest, it's 16 by 16 square acres, um, can typically only support 40 avatars at once. You can raise that, but you start to get kind of laggy. So classes over 40 people, or meetings more than 40 people, you can see how many people there are there now um, in this space. You start to run in kind of a, to slow down. That, to me, is more of an issue than can I manage them. <laughs> Uh-huh. No, you're not. Well, I guess I, I look at it, and I went on it last week. Mm -hmm. and I spent 40 minutes just doing a little, one, the appearance part of the... Everybody edits their appearance first. It's fun. Well, it's like playing dolls. Yeah. I get to, because I can figure out how to, you know, get where I'm Uh-huh. You know, I, I look at this, and you talk about, the, you know, I took a group of Girl Scouts that just began to wear kayak. Mm -hmm. You know, they were out on the water and they went, you know, onto the sandbar and their feet got stuck and they were talking to the guide. And I'm just, you know, I, I think of students and 
you know, I think of my, you know, my teenage daughter and who's I am a lot. Mm -hmm. And I just feel that we're just moving farther and farther away from an interaction with a real person in conversation. And that people are, you know, especially, you know, teenagers and my kids at that age are going to lose, you know, that ability to communicate, you know, because they, they talk in this I am language. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> Maybe I'm just getting too... No, no, I, I understand. It's really yeah. Scary when I hear, you know, I go to presentations at my kids' schools, and I hear some of the kids getting up there and speaking, and they can't speak. Right. And I'm wondering, is there that evil side of this? That, that <laughs> the dark side. There's a death yeah. to that part of education, and that, that, you know, yeah, it's hands-on, but it's not, you can't feel it, you can't see the expression. That is certainly a concern. Um, if a lot of people ask me, well, are you afraid your students will become addicted to this? You know, like they won't want to leave. And I'm not worried about that. Um, but I am concerned about genre in communication. I, I want to make sure they understand the difference between way, the way you um, communicate in an IM versus a blog versus an email versus a formal research paper. If I see a smiley face in a formal research paper, they're missing some points. You know, there's going to be some red on the paper, right? Um, but the bottom line is, they're already communicating this way, and they're going to keep doing it whether we like it or not. So, you know, when you teach someone a foreign language, you don't just throw them into a space where they only speak that language, and you don't equate it to their home language at all. You have to give them some handholds, right, to get them into that foreign language. Well, they already speak this language. They're already using it. And they're going to continue to use it in their professional lives and their personal lives. It's not going to go away. So for me, getting my students into Second Life and accessing that form of socialization that they already use is a way for me to tap into the work, that they, the work they already do and use it to my advantage to teach them what I think they need to know. So in a, in a sense, I'm speaking their language and then I'm lure, luring them, really tricking them, into learning <laughs> what I want them to learn. But in the, in the part of your question about face-to-face -face communication, the big benefit of Second Life Ed is for distance ed. We know from research that the two big reasons why over 30% of people quit distance ed programs are they complain that they are, don't feel familiar with their fellow students, they don't feel part of a learning community, and they feel like they have no face-to-face -face interaction with their instructor. And Second Life remedies both of those problems. When you are in a physical shared space in Second Life, you feel like people are there with you. It's not like this, but it's very close to this. It's much closer to this than an instant message, a group instant message chat, right? And your instructor, you have a face to link with them. You get more of their personality. Again, because we have these flexible identities in Second Life, we can express our, our personality through our avatar. So you learn a little bit more about them. Then have a dorm room or something like I have on my island, and all of a sudden it's like walking around their house. You know, what do they like? Oh, they like that band. They have that poster up. They like, uh, oh, this black leather couch. That says something to me about them. And so you get to... Um, sort of become more personable. So it may not be as good as meeting face to face, but it's close. And it also has some benefits. Um, if I was an extreme extrovert or, or introvert, giving this presentation might make me a little <laughs> nervous, yeah? But if it was me doing it that way, and I was very introverted, probably not nearly as nervous because those people aren't in my face, right? Um, but they feel here. Too. But they feel like I'm there. So introverted, introverted students in my classes, the ones in the face-to-face -face sessions who are kind of quiet, in Second Life, they're some of the most outspoken students in the class, and so it sort of mediates some differences in personality, too. We have an online question. Oh. Radar Radio asks, into unexpected limitations in community building process. Um, unexpected limitations, no. Um, our island, Middletown Island, is open. So not just my students can go there. Anybody can. And I think that's a benefit because we are part of the larger Second Life community. We are a community into ourselves, but we're also part of this larger community. 
And so we have people who are not in education or who are in education come by the island, um, sit in on class, talk to students, collaborate with, on projects. And so for me, that's a benefit. Um, but uh, I know a lot of educators would not be cool with that. Um, they wouldn't want just, you know, Joe Bob sitting in on class and participating in the conversation. But that's okay with me, and I think my students benefit from that. So it's not really a limitation. It's, it's a benefit of being part of the community. Uh -huh. I think the reason a lot of um, instructors do the presentation audience style is because they know that they know what works and doesn't work about it. Yes. So how related to what you have traditionally taught, how you've traditionally taught your composition is are the activities that you do in Second Life, and how did you figure out what would and wouldn't work in Second Life without the students going through a semester of not learning what you intended them to learn because you were pilot testing them? Well, there's a lot of trial and fire, and there's a lot of Oh, that didn't work. What can we learn from the fact that didn't work? Hmm, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of that going on. Um, one benefit I have is that I do meet them face to face once a week. So on Tuesday nights, we will talk about a skill, let's say interviewing, and then on Thursday night, we actually do it. And we call it running amok. But they go out and they actually conduct an interview. Um, and then we talk about why it worked well or why it didn't. And because I have those face-to-face -face sessions, I can sort of rescue something that doesn't go well. I, and that's sort of a safety net for me right now. Um, but I didn't need it last semester. You know, not the Second Life Educators Community and other guinea pigs um, help at trying things out before the students. Certainly. That game that I showed you, the star board game. I tried that out with a couple other educators to make sure that it worked the way I thought it would work. Um, but, you know, if I didn't, I, I, it would have been okay. Uh, but as an educator, you have to be flexible and really roll with the punches um, because, you know, things can happen, glitches can happen, students can do unexpected things, uh, and you have to be ready to roll with that. But so far, so good. Nothing that I tried to teach them that I don't think they got because of because they learned it in the virtual space versus the real space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Playing off of that, uh, what kind of learning curve issues do you have with your students? I have about 280 students that I polled. Only about 12 of them knew what Second Life was. Mm -hmm. and one of them had an avatar. Right. So uh, this phenomenon, you know, hasn't quite caught on, mm -hmm. uh, at least among my students yet. Did you ask them if they use other virtual environments like World of Warcraft or RuneScape or anything? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my results are sort of um, skewed because I did recruit for my class. Um, and I recruited because we didn't have a lab in the English department that could run Second Life. So I didn't have a choice but to have students use their own machines. So with my students, because they were students who were already interested in these kind of spaces, I have not had problems with them uh, becoming acclimated to the system. They were already in World of Warcraft or RuneScape or EverQuest, and so they were already familiar with sort of the physics of a virtual space and moving around. Um, but I have done training with other teachers, with other students at sessions like this to get them um, up to speed. And I usually um, have to spend about an hour probably getting them used to this is forward, this is back, this is side to side, um, this is how to fly, this is how not to crash, you know, that kind of thing. And after that, they do pretty well on their own. Um, my students, I do a boot camp, I do a one night boot camp at the beginning of the semester just to make sure that they have all the basic skills down. And they usually do. We usually end up moving on to more advanced skills like building and things that aren't necessarily required. Um, but a good metaphor for it is a roller coaster. That's the one I usually use is that you go up that first hill kind of slow and it's very steep and you sort of just have to have faith that you're going to get to the top. But once you get to the top, it's like yeehaw all the way down and it's really fun. So if you can get students past learning those initial required skills, they will have, they will engage in the space. At least in my experience, they'll, they will engage. Uh huh. Um, well, the average user uh, age in Second Life is 32, um, which is the oldest average user of a virtual space um, online. Uh, you know, the average user of World of Warcraft is 16, so that's half, <laughs> right? Um, so I don't, I don't think it's a matter of age. It's not chronology. It's attitude. Well, my kids are five, 
And if they get the mouse out of my hand, they can control and tell a girl pretty well. Um, they're fearless, which is a benefit of the younger age group. They're not afraid to break it. They're not afraid to look silly trying it. Um, there is a teen grid that's 14 to 17. That's like a mirror universe of the main grid uh, of Second Life. The main grid is only 18 and up. Um, and if you're an educator, if you're an adult that wants to go into the teen grid, you have to be background checked. So they're only doing it with 14 to 17 year olds over there, but it's going pretty well. Uh huh. Great, great. Yeah, the, the, the projects that they've done in the teen grid have been very good. I mean, like Global Kids, Barry Joseph's project um, with, um, with students over there in that age group have done, they've done amazing things. Yeah. I, I don't know who had their hand up first. Yeah. I can't think of one that wouldn't be good. Um, but I, I think the, the limitation is more that some subjects at a basic level would not be good. For example, mathematics. I would not try to teach division at the most mechanical level on Second Life, but certainly fractions would be fabulous, you know, because you could actually, you know, make a pie and cut it in parts and move it around to see, you know, how many parts you would have. Um, psychology, anthropology, sociology, all wonderful in Second Life because you've got this burgeoning community that's really new and still developing social norms and mores that you could study. Um, for me, you know, English uh, writing and composition is, is very good. Literature you could do, theater you could do. Um, his, oh, huh? Language. Absolutely, because there are native speakers here that you could engage in or you could create a, you know, second language only space and, and once they get into that place they have to refer to, you know, items as they're their, their terms in other languages. Um, I, I can't think of a subject that, I, that would absolutely not work, um, but some would require you to be more creative um, in making it work, I think. Mm -hmm. What about the sciences? We have a large science school here at the med school, um, and that's where some of us come from. Mm -hmm. Well, I've seen molecular models in Second Life that are fantastic. Like you actually take atoms away and add them and they behave differently. Um, I've seen physics labs in Second Life where students are playing around with Second Life physics and comparing it to real physics. And they, they build everything from pinball machines to like Rube Goldberg machines to play with physics. Um, Astrophysics. Ast space. Yes, yeah. the lots and lots of space um, type things in Second Life. Um, yeah, there are some hospitals that are, yeah, they're, they're teaching some um, actual medical things like triage um, and they have some simulations set up for that kind of thing. But really your creativity is the limit um, and whether or not you can, um, create, whether or not your expertise in Second Life is enough to create what you want or whether you can draw on other people like to do the scripting in the building for you to create the simulation that you want. But I've seen like, cell models that are as big as this room. So you can actually go in and, and like move around the parts of a cell and see the flagellum and, and stuff and really interact with it. Uh, that would be hard to create in real life. We, uh, we have a friend also who teaches astronomy to, to uh, higher end, is it yeah. higher end? And they uh, have to put together these telescopes. Well, sometimes they break when they put them together if they don't follow the right directions. So he built a simulation in Second Life for them to have to put the telescope together in world when they get the certificate saying they've done that, then they get to work on the real world uh, telescoping, notice a dramatic drop in broken telescopes. Yeah. And a planetarium far beyond what his campus had or what they had access to, he was able to build. Yeah, it's an instantaneous planetarium. You put it in coordinates. And you can see the sky from anywhere, anytime. Way back in the back. I'm sorry. Can you load mods? Bots? Love mods. Mods. No, no. But you can build anything you want. And the interface is open source now. So you can create your own interface to it if you know um, some programming. But really, I mean, if you talk about a, a mod in a game, you know, it would be like a, 
uh, created instance or something for that game. Second Life kind of is that all the time because everything in it is user created. Only the land you stand on is created by the company that, that runs it and everything else is resident created. So anything you want, you can build, and you can script it to make items interactive. You can't, you don't take damage. Like if you get in a fight, um, my students are always getting their lightsabers out and hacking at each other. You can't die in Second Life, but you can put on settings in a in a parcel of land so that you can pretend to take damage, and uh, you can sort of die, which just sends you back to a beginning point. Is all it does. Uh huh. Are there any limitations to the company that owns and runs Second Life uh, licensing, or you know, what, what if the company just decides that they want to all of a sudden start putting limitations on what you're doing? Uh, <laughs> there, there, there is a risk. I understand what you're asking. Um, you're putting a significant amount of time and finance into something that is owned and controlled by somebody else, and and there is a risk to that. Um, Linden Lab is, they have a really great philosophy that what makes them wonderful are the residents and what the residents make. You know, all they make is land, right? And they keep the system updated. But they're great at updating the system. They, they fix bugs on a pretty constant uh, nature, which is one of the downsides of Second Life, actually, if you want to run it in a lab, is that they update about every two weeks. So you have to download a new client every couple of weeks and keep it up to date. But I don't worry about that at all because they, they're, um, the number of users has been rising exponentially and they seem to be a pretty stable company and they're very encouraging of, of their users and they know about education and they know the kind of things that we need and they don't seem to work against that. So as long as we're not uh, Well, and I can't say that Philip Rosedale, the... Um, you used to own real network. Yeah. He sold the company before. Yeah. So, you know. having having met him, Second Life is his dream, and I don't think he's going to give up give it up. No. Mm -hmm. um, what are the costs associated with using Second Life from both a user, like a student in a class, as well as an educator? Like, how much money do you need to put into it before you get an environment that you can teach in? Yeah. And also participate. An account is free. You can go into Second Life for absolutely nothing. Didn't pay My students don't pay a dime, right? Kind of right. Of yeah. The Center for Media Design owns the land that that we use, and they purchased that. Now this is old pricing. They paid a thousand dollars for the island um, because it's a server. So you're having Linden put up a server, and then you pay a monthly maintenance fee of 150. Those rates have gone up a little bit, but you never have to pay that thousand dollars again. I think it it may be fifteen or seventeen hundred now is that first price. But educators get a little bit of a discount. Um, so once the land is up, if you choose to teach on your own private land, th that cost incurs, and the account that owns the land itself has to pay $9.95 a month. But your students never have to pay a dime. Um, but you don't have to own land to teach there. There's plenty of public spaces, sandboxes, education spots. Like I let people teach classes on my land all the time because we have 16 square acres and there's 18 of us. How much space do we need, right? Sure. I'm looking for projects, um, ideas from the campus to implement on our land. Yeah, we do have a couple of landmarks just to kind of mark it. Mm -hmm. There's a whole other island that needs to There's develop. all this open space. We're yeah. looking for projects on this campus um, to implement on that island. It's like a huge parcel of land has opened up right beside the campus, and you're allowed to build on that for free. And it can't and be parking lots. <laughs> so as educators, it's kind of your responsibility if you're interested to fill it up get in there and fill it up but as far as other expenses um, the one mistake I did make make when I applied for my space was I did not budget for incidental costs and um, uploading textures so you know if I want this carpet I take a picture of it I upload the JPEG and I apply it to a prim to make it look like this carpet uploading that costs 10 linden and it's between 250 and 300 linden to the dollar is the exchange so it cost me a few cents to upload the carpet uh, texture. So when my students um, build lar their large campaign center and stuff at the end of the semester, they need a little money to pay for their, their texture uploads um, and sound uploads and things like that. And so I gave each team a hundred Linden. Ooh, you know, 30 That's cents. <laughs> I gave them a 30 cent budget and I gave it to one person on the team and said, you have to make, make decisions as a group about what you're going to do with this money, this big money. Um, 
And I did that out of my own pocket, you know, uh, just because I didn't factor it into my grant when I wrote it. Uh huh. So, so far we've been talking about um, educators using this. Mm -hmm. Is there any type of, for other potential uses, is there any type of security measures that can be implemented for users coming in or out? Like you say, you have guests all the time mm -hmm. coming to your classes. What if you didn't want that? I could lock my island down. I could limit that only people in the land group, like my students are in a group. So they're all assigned this membership to this group for my class. And that lets me disseminate information to them quickly and stuff like that. It has other uses. But I could set permission on the land to only allow in people in the group. So everybody else would sort of bounce off an invisible wall when they came in. And I could turn that on just for class and then turn it off again if I wanted to. I could have it set so that anybody could come, but only people in the group could build. And nobody else could. So there, there's a lot of granularity to the controls. Has there ever been an issue with um, this as far as someone doing something? Like griefers. Like they call them griefers, yeah. You know, who are you? You're not supposed to be here. Why are you here? You're just broke your <laughs> I haven't had that issue. I, I, you know, I can imagine that it would happen. For me, because I teach a lot of online culture and responsibility and identity issues in my class, the, the only one time we've ever had any problem, this guy showed up right before class started and he was kind of mingling with the students and I didn't know who he was and I didn't know why he was there. And normally I know if educators are coming to observe class, I know who they are, you know, and I didn't recognize him. And somebody said, well, we're about to start class and uh, he said something snarky and then sort of tried to cuss one of them out, right? And so I opened up the land management tools and I typed in his name and I said, ban, and this guy goes and flies off the island never to return. Gone! Right? It's yeah. like if somebody came into your classroom here, you could move them to Raleigh. Yeah, if you could just pick them up and drop them somewhere else. But, the, but then we talked about it and we said, what, what identity was he projecting? What was the rhetoric of that kind of talk? And so we used it as a learning ex experience. But if we didn't want to, I could have just ejected him. The students never would have noticed. He would have been gone. He could never come back. So you, you have a lot of control. Well, what about the security of the information you're talking about? Like my intellectual property of my teaching material, like that? Yeah, and I, and I think it, yes, and, it, and thinking about different industries and, and potential uses, mm -hmm. they might have a lot of issues with the terms of service protect you a lot. For example, I could not um, take the transcript of this chat and post it on my blog without the permission of everybody in that group. If one of them disagreed and I displayed their name on my blog and what they said in that chat, I could get banned from Second Life because of the terms of service. Everything you build and own in Second Life is your intellectual property. So if I construct a whiteboard in Second Life that's interactive, that's just for my class, it's mine. And nobody can copy it or take it unless I allow them to. And if they do, I can report them and, and action will be taken. So um, just to build on that, IBM has several sites online. And last week, Bob Suter, he's the vice president for open source and open standards, was here. Uh, not in Second Life, but he's very active there. And so at Biblia, we have links to this talk all the videos. So you can see that and see what it says. And also, you can like, check out his website, which is for things that are interesting for people that want to do Second Life and that happen to be a business, not necessarily educators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how do you differentiate between skills in Second Life and the skills in the other course content? That's an interesting question. A lot of people say, well, do you teach Second Life or do you teach composition? You know, like um, I, I ask my students to, yeah, I ask my students to learn basic building and they say, well, how does that, you know, if you teach them how to resize a box, how does that have to do with writing? You know, how is it related? Um, for me, I go back to G's idea of the semiotic domain transfer between video games and real, and what we consider real life learning. And so what I do is I reinforce translating learning second life skills into real life, what we would call real life skills. So for example, if they have to learn how to manage um, chatting in a group IM with lots of people chatting at the same time, we might talk in class about how that sort of multitasking, 
how it's important to learn how to take turns and respond to what other people say thoughtfully. Um, if they decide to make an outfit, for example, for a, a class project, they're going to use Photoshop and create target files to upload those, those clothes. And so they're learning Photoshop to do something for the class. And, uh, or if they script in Second Life, they're learning a language that's very close to C Sharp, the lending stri scripting language. And so they're not learning skills that are only useful in Second Life. They're learning skills that can easily be translated into other areas. Um, and, and more kind of general learning skills. Does that answer your question, sort of? Somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think she was also, mm -hmm. also concerned about uh, not marking or grading on Second Life skills. Is that yeah, I do, I do not evaluate whether or not they can fly and land gracefully or anything like that. Um, but I do require that they learn how to use the tools in some semblance, just like I would require them to know how to use Word. But I also help them learn it. So, uh, you know, I'm available a lot because I also do research in addition to teaching in Second Life, so I'm around a lot. And, and I offer them other resources to learn how to do some of those things. But I don't evaluate them on, like, the aesthetics of something they build. I evaluate them on whether or not it meets the rhetorical situation that they were assigned to meet. Uh-huh. Dynamics, like students creating cults and um, maybe social networking clicks within the class. I just wonder if you see those same I, dynamics move into the. I haven't seen that. My, my classes tend to band together really tightly because they're sort of engaged in an experiment and they know that, and so they stick together. Um, but there is interesting social dynamics in Second Life itself. Um, but they're less related to uh, socioeconomic and more related to experience in Second Life. So if you show up, let's say, to a dance club in your noob avatar, the avatar you get by default, people are going to treat you differently than if you, sh if you showed up in like, nice clothes and you know, like, uh, well-designed hair or whatever. And, and so it has more to do with experience and like, socioeconomic stuff. Yeah. But, but that avatar look is directly related to socioeconomic. Well, but it's not that they haven't spent the money. It's that they're new to Second Life and they don't know how to do it yet. Yeah, because you could create everything you want to make a really nice avatar without spending a dime if you knew how to do it. Now, we're going we're gonna to have to start. start. We, we want to keep the discussion going, but we also want to sort of get towards the end here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we want to start it, but we want to end it. Wait, 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 so uh, we do hope the discussion will keep going on on campus, and I think we can take maybe... Should we do two more questions just so for people who are holding out to ask them? Yeah, who's been waiting that I've missed? <laughs> he's, he's been very In the Bay shirt, he has questions. Oh. Okay, well, I had a question about the identity. Mm -hmm. So, um, don't you think there will be conflict between the, the real identity and the virtual identity? So, you say you can be, yes, you can be anything of the thing in the virtual, but that's not what you are in the real world. And mm -hmm. when you go out with a job and all kind of stuff, you can take your second life with you. You've got to be in the first life. Right. <laughs> so just because they practice being, for example, an entrepreneur in Second Life, can they go and apply for a loan at the bank and go, well, I've been running a Second Life business for two years, so give me the loan, right? Um, yeah, th th there is some translation trouble there. But the skills they learn are, are easily translatable, but the status might not be. Um, yeah, you need to read Sherry Turkle's Life on Screen. Um, but as, as far as... Yeah, identity conflicts with students, though, it's an interesting topic that you bring up because if you're going to teach in Second Life, get ready to memorize two, two names for all of your students. At least. Yeah, I, I run a, I, we have a blog site, too, and so they sometimes use just their first name or last name or they use a handle on there. And so some of my students, I have to memorize three names. And I certainly can't recognize who they are in Second Life. It, it creates sort of a conundrum about who to give credit to. And so I rely a lot on my, on my chat logs to know who contributed what for participation grades and things like that. So identity gets fuzzy in the space between. And do I know that their roommate's not driving their avatar during class and being brilliant for them? No, I don't. I have to trust them. One more? One more. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Second Life is one solution in this area. 
you're building things in Second Life. Do you have ownership of those where you could move them into another area? Are you doing anything with SketchUp or moving it into Second Life? I mean, you're, you're participating in all these other areas mm -hmm. um, of the internet, creating all kinds of media. I would imagine there's a lot of overlap with what you're doing there and in Second Life. Yeah, there is some. Yeah, um, I do a lot with screenshots, and I do some machinima, um, which is where you use screen capture software to make movies, um, moving movies from a video game or a virtual environment. So we do that kind of stuff, and we um, do uh, like online newspapers and things like that that look like they're part of Second Life but aren't. Um, but like you mentioned SketchUp, SketchUp is a free, um, almost an AutoCAD type program. There is a way to merge SketchUp and Second Life, but it messes up really bad. Um, so uh, as far as like taking things out of the system, no, I don't. Um, but there are um, tools in Second Life that allow students to blog right out of Second Life, um, or to IM, or Twitter from inside Second Life, or to Second Life. And so we do some things like that. But I do try to converge as many media as I can. Like we stream in podcasts and movies and quick time stuff, yeah, if we can. Okay, we're like half an hour over time. Yeah, you guys got places to go. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Thank you.